And we're very happy to have here with us tonight Christian and Arthur. So please give it up and have a lot of fun with the talk. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's really a privilege to be here. This is an amazing uh, event. Uh, so we're going to introduce the project and talk a bit about the scientific uh, aspect behind it, as well as uh, sort of the journey we've taken over the last three years that we've been working and how our methodology has kind of evolved over that, that whole process. So really the, the main question behind the project that we've kind of been addressing the whole time is what would the world be like if you could see through the eyes of someone else? If people who are in conflict on different sides of a war could experience what it's like to be someone else, their story their family and so forth. How would that affect our ability to connect and uh, resolve conflicts? Um, so really what we're looking at is the, is the relationship between identity and empathy. How you construct your identity and how that inhibits or facilitates empathy. So, um, so here's uh, an example of some research that uh, is happening in this uh, movement we're seeing in neuroscience uh, in the past 10 years. in. Uh, embodied cognition and around uh, empathy. Uh, this, for example, is a study that showed that there was a stronger um, correlation between in the, in the re neural representation of threat. So you would um, do a, a, a brain scan of a person being threatened uh, to be hurt, and, and, and you would record a, the same person uh, looking at um, someone else being threatened. And when there was uh, those two Two persons were close. They had uh, were like uh, family ties or friends. There was um, a stronger collation on the in the representation of threat. So in a way, familiarity was promoting uh, sort of blurriness of uh, self other representation on a on a neurological level. Yeah, basically the difference like uh, between you and the other person neurologically is not that different than if they're being threatened and you feel close to them. Um, so we have also uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti, who is uh, in, uh, investigating mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are specifically uh, specific neurons which fire when you both uh, perceive an action and when you take that action yourself as well. And there's a nice quote from him there. We're going to kind of go a bit fast because we have, I think, too, ma too many slides. Yeah. Um, so one of the um, kind of illusions that you can uh, induce is a very well-known uh, rebel hand illusion that when you see uh, plastic hand being uh, touched and you feel your rear hand is why it's hidden behind the blanket uh, rubbed at the same time in the same area you can induce the feeling of owning a plastic hand and this kind of effect uh, is uh, further investigated by um, uh, Ersen Lab in, in uh, Karolinska Institute in, in, in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, using um, replacing visual feedback uh, through virtual reality headsets and cameras. So, in this sense, in this, in this, in this example, uh, they were studying how owning a plastic body, uh, so using the same technique of touching the two feet at the same time, would affect the perception, for instance, of the, the world around you. So, uh, yeah, the size of your own body determines the perceived, perceived uh, size of the of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that with that, um, it's basically that your senses don't operate independently of each other. There's, they affect each other all the time. And so from that, you can hack your body's perception about itself and override your own sense of body ownership. So we see also uh, another uh, lab, uh, event lab in Barcelona um, led by Mel Slater. And they've done some really interesting research of what that means also socially, how you can change your perception about stuff. Using embodiment effect and in a, this case, a virtual world, they've uh, seen that if you put a white person in the skin of a black and a uh, avatar with black skin that actually reduces their implicit racial bias. So this is not the kind of bias that you say you have, but it's the bias that is in, uh, that they detect through uh, some sort of rigorous testing afterwards. So this is really the inspiration behind uh, the project. And we decided to take this and put it in a different context, put it in an artistic context, investigate the ethical implications of it and other possible uses. So this is a, an early slide uh, or an early picture of how we started out. Uh, we're using uh, like very low budget stuff, uh, things we bought from China, um, virtual reality glasses from the 90s that we kind of got from the university somehow, and uh, really just started experimenting with these uh, ideas and experiments, trying to recreate them and see what would happen. So the kind of uh, first system that we have uh, been using, uh, there's been further iteration after that, uh, was kind of like clearly inspired by the research we are showing before, uh, except that we tried to replace a virtual environment by a sort of a human element. Uh, we're not using virtually generated uh, environments through uh, computation, but rather using another pers uh, person's uh, uh, sensory motor contingencies to, to transfer the, the body. So we um, 
here we're using the Oculus Rift, we're using other headsets before, which is sent to a um, um, servo-mounted camera, which follows the head movements, and the performer will be copying the movements of the, of the user, and we use identical objects and identical spaces so that they can get uh, appropriate uh, touch feedback. So really, um, what we're looking at here is how to use this in, how to develop this project in different contexts. So uh, one of the first places that we started doing this was in Lestruc, which is a performing arts center outside of Barcelona. And they have an interesting association with the Indignados movement in Spain. So there's a lot of different community groups and activist groups within this place. So the idea was to find a methodology that would allow us to investigate this uh, without hierarchy. So we're, we're not just saying, oh, we're the technical people and we're going to tell you how to do this, but rather say, here's the, how the system works, here's the technology, here's the scientific aspect. What would you use it for? What kind of uh, stories or situations would you like to explore using this? And so through working with anthropologists and community organizers, uh, women's groups, uh, dancers, uh, hackers, a bunch of different people, we tried to kind of create a bunch of different uh, experiments and situations and see what would come out of this. Uh, this is one of the first ones. Here you see basically the two um, identical... Oh, yeah. Uh, here you see two identical uh, spaces, uh, identical objects, and uh, then, uh, as Arthur was saying, the user will reach out, uh, pick up an object that they see, the object is there, um, and at the same time it's in the other space. So they can, uh, they can feel that and then at the same time, this is associated to narrative. So we would have a pre-recorded narrative of the person that they're embodying associated to different objects. So you can branch the narrative then in a sort of embodied theater kind of way, in non-linear uh, form. So that's really uh, the first iterations that happened there. Um, other experiments we did, uh, maybe you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, so that was uh, Sarah and, um, and her mother, Anna, who's an artist. And they they came out they came they reached out to us and uh, were talking about the kind of dif difficulties they had in their relationship, and they were trying to figure out a way to 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 do some kind of performance around that. And uh, Sarah made a very beautiful story about uh, it was very poetic and very um, interesting metaphors for such a, a young kid. She was talking uh, the story was called the the girl with the red tears with the. Was, blood, tears, and talking about, through the story, about, um, um, about her difficulties uh, relating to other people at school, and her mother was, uh, so, and while she was telling the story, she was drawing it, and her mother was kind of like copying the movement to get this um, embodiment effect in, into uh, the, the world and story and, and, and feelings of her daughter uh, to hopefully get a uh, better understanding, and it worked, it worked in, in, in both ways, I think, uh, both as a um, sort of self-empowerment empowerment tool for for Sarah and, and Anna to get a, like a sort of insider connection into that, uh, that story. Mm. So it's really like the kind of experiences that people, I mean, we tried the experiment and it was like, oh, this is interesting. But once we started sharing it with people and they were creating their own experiences, it became, it seemed very powerful. They, they came back weeks later and were like, wow, that's amazing that she's doing better in school. We have a better relationship now. And this kind of stuff was really what motivated us to keep on working because we weren't being paid. This was entirely self-funded. And uh, we're like, okay, well, let's see what other things we could do. So one of the other uh, people we worked with was uh, Yusefa, who was uh, an illegal immigrant in Spain who had come over illegally on a raft and had been living in the street, had uh, learned to read, learned to write, and eventually became a dance instructor. And he wanted to share his story with people in the local community where he lived. So we worked with him over the course of several weeks and figured out different protocols and recorded some audio and had different objects that he could inter that people could interact with. And then we presented this as a public performance uh, for people in the in the town where we were. And uh, it was amazing. Like you see, like this is really I think what became interesting. It wasn't that the technology was like uh, providing something that um, that was needed, you know, like you don't need the technology. What it is is it provides a context where you're in this liminal space. You're not quite yourself. You're not quite the other person. And what happens in that space is the starting point for dialogue afterwards. That's really how we try to use this technology, like whatever video game equipment and stuff, and bring the folk co-opted and bring the focus back towards something human. When you take when they take it off, they're actually facing the uh, the person that they just were, and before that they were just interacting and experiencing themselves from the perspective of the other person. And that's really what seems to be a powerful experience. After taking it off, the people who don't know him, you know, he's a big, tall guy, you know, or like just wanted to reach out and hug him. And it was kind of these sort of experiences was kept on confirming to us that, uh, that we're sort of onto something there. Yeah, we've been also working with an um, in integrated uh, dance uh, company, which uh, featured both uh, people in wheelchairs and able-bodied dancers. And through uh, exchanging with them, uh, one of the um, 
suggestion that came out from uh, wheelchair users, what they, they wanted to see themselves uh, then seeing standing up, which was like kind of thing. We, 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 I mean, I think nothing would have come to our idea to, to propose that because it, it seems seems kind of weird. But after that, um, we developed some kind of choreographic language where, uh, using his hands, he could. Uh, there was an improvisation happening with a dancer, uh, which was uh, used to um, create to. Um, to, yeah, to add the movements of the rest of the body, and so they could see themselves uh, dancing through the camera of the of the person standing up. Yeah, there's all these videos online. We don't really have much time to show them now, but you can just look online and find documentation about these projects. But one of the interesting things about this is how it relates to, say, if we were doing this in a, an academic institution or scientific institution, it'd be very, very difficult to get an ethical approval for this because, like, some of these people had never walked. What if they had a traumatic uh, experience or they became depressed afterwards? Um, you know, it'd be very difficult to get ethical approval to run this kind of uh, experience or experiment. But when you're working in an artistic context, it's a lot more flexible, and also it allows for this kind of horizontal uh, collaboration that's more egalitarian. You don't, you're not, they're not your research subject, they are co-creating the whole experience uh, with you in that process. And uh, then, yeah, we, uh, this, this uh, video which uh, kind of uh, Got brought a lot of, uh, of attention, like quite in, unintentionally, uh, uh, I should uh, I should say. Um, we just posted the video and it and it went viral. It just happened when we thought the project was actually about to end because we were uh, all uh, so we all uh, working together in, in Barcelona was um, was four of us at the time, and um, we all that went to a different country to um, to make a living. Uh, but in the meantime, we. Uh, we a lot of people came started reaching out to us to uh, after seeing this video and it, it kind of served as an introduction to all the work we had been doing um, before um, and it, it yeah it also happened through or the idea I think came out of the suggestion uh, uh, some people yeah, made. Yeah, we were uh, in one of the open, <clears throat> open, because a lot of this stuff happened during this open hack labs. And so one couple came to us, actually, they're two friends, I think male and female, and they're like, oh, we really want to kind of explore each other's bodies. Can you just give us the equipment and we'll, you know, go off into the room on our own? Like, yeah, sure, okay, no problem. And then they came out afterwards and they were like, wow, that was totally amazing. Like, okay, so how can we. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. So the idea is. So we thought, okay, how can we expand on that? So this setup is different than the other one. Rather than having a user and a performer, you have uh, two users, basically. They're swapping perspectives. And in order for the embodiment effect to work, they have to stay in sync. So that means that all, of, all the actions that they're doing have to be agreed, like kind of non-verbally. And it creates like this interesting dance of agency and consent, you know, where every, like if, you know, I mean, you know, whatever, the stereotypical thing that you might think is like, oh, wow, I have breasts now, I can go like this. But I mean, like if you do that and they don't want to, you're not going to see it. You know, you're just going to be an asshole. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is like it, it just changed the whole relationship then between between the two people who were experiencing it and uh, and yeah that was that was really interesting so uh, we got loads of attention from this like unexpectedly um, we didn't even promote it just got found on somewhere and yeah, yeah. and then the problem is that we had to actually show it uh, in installations yeah so they invited us to, like do an installation <laughs> now it's like we don't normally work in installation but we did we started developing stuff and we've been invited to a bunch of different events so we went to some uh, medical hacking day thing and started then really because lots of people from different fields contacted us, like whether cognitive science researchers, performing arts people, people involved in conflict resolution, all this stuff. And so we started seeing, wow, actually this idea, this concept, this sort of stuff has applications in lots of niche fields. How do we expand this? So, you know, of course it's open source and stuff. We thought, well, let's just, just share it and try to go to all these places where they're inviting us and see what we can get. So this is one of the experiments. You want to talk this, about this? Yeah, uh, that, well, yeah that was some um, sort of... Um, pre-experiments, we're trying to see if the design, the system could be used in this way, uh, in kind of like a replication with our system of um, virtual, virtual environment uh, therapies uh, for burn victims where they, they found out, and it's actually used in hospitals sometimes, uh, that for se se severe burn victims, when you put them in the video game where they like throw snowballs at uh, penguins and polar bears, it kind of distracts them from the pain, like from pain that's chronic pain that they cannot get rid of, and with this kind of distraction work. So we we have been looking at uh, this kind of, um, so we put, we, we measure the pain tolerance with uh, the hand, like how long you, you, you can stand with uh, your hand in a bucket of ice with controlled temperature, um, with and without uh, the, the system. So doing this kind of respiration uh, exercise, focusing on your body while being um, another person. Mm -hmm. uh, 
It seemed it seemed the the semi control um, yeah this was result in, um, environment results seemed to indicate that there was a, a positive effect yeah it was in collaboration with two different uh, neuroscientists from different universities this is like a a pilot study so in addition we also went of course to some different uh, art exhibitions this is in Eindhoven at a queer art exhibition called Gender Blender and then we realized that showing the art in these contexts uh, provides us an opportunity to to do to do user testing in a way, you know, like you're exposed to a much broader uh, section of the population than you would if you're in a research institution where you're dealing with mostly 20 to 30 year old white males with a technology background. So if all of a sudden we're being invited to all these places, we thought, well, let's go and show it and really be there and do it as kind of a technical and anthropological research at the same time. Um, so this is this was some workshop at a reaching conference in uh, September in Berlin, where we had a workshop with people showing them how to use it. Uh, yeah, and then um, there's a series of pictures. With, uh, this is in Sao Paulo in Brazil Paulo, as well. Uh, this is in Spain again, uh, working with dancers this time. There's lots of different iterations of the project that we've sort of gone through, but there's more documentation online. Uh, yeah, this was interesting. This is uh, one of the people who contacted us actually after the video went viral. Uh, it works in uh, the United Nations and uh, the Alliance of Civilizations, which is a small kind of department that funds and researches uh, experimental projects and conflict resolution. So he'd actually had the same idea using neuroscience, embodiment, virtual reality, storytelling, performance to address conflict specifically, but he hadn't found anyone to work on it, didn't have the skills himself. So when he found us, he was like, wow, and we we're like, oh, cool, this is amazing. So we just said, yeah, join the team, you know, like it's, you know, it's open. So since then, uh, this was a project that we, we sort of participated in. It was a retreat for Somali diaspora uh, storytellers. So that would be journalists and artists and poets and writers and activists and documentary makers uh, looking at intertribal conflict. So this is, a, of course, it's a tricky situation. You go there and you don't want to be like, oh, we're the white European guys with some technology that's going to fix all your problems. You know, you have to kind of go there and say, right, we just have this stuff we've been working on. What do you think of it? How would you use it? What's the context? How do, do we create a context together that this might be useful? Maybe it's not useful, but we, you need to try to have this this dialogue so I think that's really like where we're at now um, we're we, you know we've been invited to MIT for a year to do some research there as well uh, we're also got invited to two events in uh, Israel and so we decided well we're going to Israel let's see if we can connect those two events and stay in Israel for a month and then we're like well if we're in Israel we might as well try to go to Palestine as well okay there's no funding how do we do that but let's run so with the idea is we're going to run two concurrent uh, simultaneous sort of workshop development periods with members of the community activists artists hackers in Israel and Palestine and try to network these people and interconnect the results across the border as well looking everyone with the same common goal of like how do we address conflict and just see what comes out of that. Maybe it's to do with the machine, maybe it's not, but using it as a tool to really build networks of people who work and can collaborate on a horizontal level and find the tools for communicating uh, in an interdisciplinary manner uh, is really what we're, what we're interested in doing um, with the future of the project. So yeah, we have uh, we have um, like we're talking about before open open source platform. We have this some um, three uh, printed hardware that was designed for us by uh, FabLab Barcelona. Uh, we always work with really um, low budget technology. So this is this jacket you're seeing is a bunch of yeah, 3D printed pieces, uh, PlayStation cameras, some Arduino in the back. Uh, the really most expensive piece of hardware is the computer in it, I guess, and, uh, and the Oculus. And um, we, I invite uh, all the coders in, in the room to check out our GitHub and uh, reach out to us if they have any idea how they would, they would like to contribute. There's a lot of things that we need help with uh, on, the t on the technical level as well. And um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's um, yeah. I guess like also just thinking about this sort of uh, context and way we're working, we're also interested in other people who are maybe working maybe with different projects, but also in an interdisciplinary manner. Like, how useful is it like to design stuff? Like, if you're working with like PGP adoption or something like that, you know, working directly with users and stuff or people in the field to actually co-create these tools and methods of usage. Maybe there's people working on that here. Or maybe there's stuff that we've been doing over the last few years which can contribute to these kind of things in terms of formalizing a methodology for kind of collaborative development of projects that are interdisciplinary. Um, yeah, I think that's that's basically it. So thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you, Christian and Arthur. The good news is we still have like 10 minutes for questions and answers, so please line up at the microphones here in the hallway. Um, we start with a question from the internet. Oh, hi. Um, the question from the internet is more related to um, yeah, how you can use uh, this technology also in other fields. Like, would you say you could help people with body image issues like anorexia or something to recalibrate yes, this perception of their own body? That's, that's, that's part of the thing we have been talking with uh, some uh, neurologists that's working exactly in that uh, at this um, hacking medicine event in Madrid. That was a possibility. You could do that in virtual reality. Right now, the way it's done is to assess if someone has a bad, badly assessed body image. Is that just show a bunch of pictures to a person, and um, and on every picture they say, "Oh yeah, this is bigger than me, thinner than me, bigger than me." But you could really Im easily imagine doing that uh, with with someone else, right? And giving like all the agency and like the really the the, the strong thing about the. The machine is like we're using the real world, and you, the, it's actually, I think so far, it's uh, as strange as it might seem, it's, it's more convincing to use a video feed with like uh, uh, some movement, with maybe some approximation and some latency than just a virtual environment. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to imagine how it could be better um, quickly, but then the, f the flexibility of, of, uh, of using just really simple technology and the, and the real world is, I think, allows us to, ex to, to explore very quickly different things. And that was uh, something we, uh, we possibly Yeah, we actually met with someone who found the project and was saying, I've, I've been on Rexit for 20-something years, and I would like to come and meet you. So they actually traveled to meet us at one of the events we were doing, and were able to try the system and make some recommendations. I mean, you know, we said, well, we're not you know, doctors. We, don't, we can't promise you anything. But like, no, no, I just want to go and, and participate and see what I can you know, kind of offer in terms of that. So there was like, there has been some initial kind of dialogue about that and working with people, you know, patients, and this kind of uh, horizontal sort of uh, yeah. structure. Do you know any medical papers on that? Um, medical papers on anorexia and virtual reality? Yes. Um, there could be. Uh, I can't think off the top of my head, but if you want to email us or whatever, we can talk later as well. All right, thanks for the input. Next question for microphone three. Yeah, hi. Um, I've read that there are sort of two different ways that different individuals process uh, visual input and reconcile it with how they're you know, where they are in space, and that uh, one of those modes makes people more prone to things like motion sickness from virtual reality equipment, and it happens that those things break down across gender lines. It's more common for women to be mm. um, motion sick from VR technologies. And I was wondering if you have seen much of that in your observations of your project, if you have um, many women involved uh, working with you regularly. I know you commented about you know the typical white dudes in technology problem. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could speak to that, I would find that really interesting. Yeah, um, in terms of uh, we've not necessarily done a, a quantifiable analysis of everyone, every participant that we've worked with. I've worked in this field before as well, and yeah, you're right. There is differences in how this is perceived by people also across age as well. I was working in uh, VR rehabilitation for people with stroke, which is mostly elderly as well. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a big difference. Um, in terms of motion sickness, I don't think we've observed any kind of effect. That would, that, but that's that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that was that was happening. We that's, think, uh, mm -hmm. Um, do you think that that could be related to the fact that you're actually, you know, coordinating with another person and so that the timing maybe works out better or is it just, um, you have no idea because that's a totally valid answer. Um, so there's, a, there's some very technical stuff about why um, we haven't had too many issues with motion sickness. We actually cut off, uh, we're changing the orientation of the camera so you have greater up and down orientation and less side issues so that there's... Uh, there's less motion sickness because it's not your entire field of view that's that's covered in this case. Um, so anyway, but uh, yeah. all right, thanks. Next question for microphone two. Oh, all right, yeah. This would be a question about the setup we've seen in the slides. Um, it looked like there was just one camera essentially. Did you get a proper stereoscopic view enabling depth perception on the Oculus? Uh, we have been working with a bunch of stereo cameras. Uh, is it this setup you were talking about? Yeah, this is yeah. this is Mono. This is Mono. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, we just duplicate the signal, uh, but on... Yeah, one of the issues with using stereoscopic cameras in an installation setup is that you have to kind of calibrate per user with interpupillary distance, so yeah, it makes course. it a lot simpler if we just, you know, if we're getting people in and out or whatever, and it's chaos, then, you know, it's easier. We do have some that's like a mechanical way of actually adjusting the cameras, and then you can also do it with software too, but we don't generally use that in, in whenever we do installation. But on, yeah, and on this one, for example, we, we yeah. had a bunch of stereo cameras. This one was stereo. Trying to build our own was a bit complicated. This one we're not available are not available anymore. But we have we've had some. Yeah, it's it really makes the immersion stronger. Mm. Of course, uh, especially in close quarters when you're looking at your hand and your body, it makes like sort of less of a difference in like after a couple of meters. But uh, yeah, it's actually important, definitely. Right. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, it seems to me that there's another question from the internet. Yes, there is. So, how well do you think is the immersion controllable by the user? What's like the risk of abuse for this technology, like for torturing or anything in this direction? I think there's. That's one of the main reasons that we're interested in kind of taking the project ourselves to these different contexts. Like we've been to art things, we've been to documentary. We're now at MIT, which you know doesn't have a very ethical record in a lot of ways, and it's like it's interesting to go to this context and kind of sort of bring the ideology that's kind of brought the, uh, made the project what it is so far into these contexts and see how we can sort of keep that going. Um, I think there's obviously uses for torture uh, with this or whatever, but I mean, we're not so worried about that. I think the co-option that could happen is that, you know, you have this, uh, like, as uh, just an immersive experience that you have on your own. Really what we're focusing on here is bringing, creating a context that brings you back towards dealing with someone in reality. You take off the the gear and then the experience is really, then the meaningful part happens in that, in that way. That's really what we're looking at is creating a kind of a social context uh, with this as just the starting point. All right, next question from microphone three. How do you measure increased empathy and what kind of methodological issues have you seen arising with that? Ooh, we, well, we, yeah, we haven't actually started... Um, Quantifiable uh, empathy is, yeah, that's not something that we've been doing so much at the moment. We've been working at uh, setting up some different collaborations with some other universities doing comparative studies uh, with uh, this and other things regarding virtual reality and empathy. Now, the en environments we're working in are quite chaotic, so having, you know, a measurable scientific, it doesn't really work. So there's methodologies that we can use. Some of them don't necessarily work, but some of the things we try here, I think, are useful to bring back into maybe a more clinical environment and investigate there. That's one of the stuff, things we're going to be doing while we're in MIT, for instance, is trying to, you know, make a more rigorous setup of some of the stuff we've tried in the field. Another question from the internet? Yes, two short ones actually. Like one would know how long the longest experiment with two people thinking was, and the other is whether there will be a demo or a workshop um, with you the next day. Actually, yeah, good question, because we forgot to mention. We are running a workshop here, but we haven't been able to book it because the wiki was down. So if you want to check our Twitter, then we can, uh, we will have that organized at some point. I'm thinking tomorrow or at some point. But if, if you see us around and there's people who want to hack and you have a space already at your desk, we have all the gear here already. So just let us know and we can get stuff going. Um, in terms of the other question, which was, um, I forgot. I, I didn't understand. The first part of the question? Was there? I didn't get the question, the first part. Um, how long the thinking of two people oh. um, lasted? Yeah, I think the longest one we did was we kept one of our research, uh, one of our team members in there for uh, two hours, I think. Uh, but it wasn't with one other person in this case, it was lots of other people swapping with him and he didn't take it off the whole time. So he was quite disoriented by the end of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, since you mentioned your Twitter account, maybe you want to go back to the last yeah. slide so people can note it down. And yep. I think this would be the very last question from microphone two. Okay, thanks. Um, my question is about, you uh, said this is more like an art project of yours, but you already mentioned some universities. So are you aware of some uh, scientific research uh, be, uh, already in the making right now with your setup? Or are there already papers, maybe? We have... Um, Some we people publish asked a paper. to or explain mm -hmm. them, like, how to replicate it, uh, inspired by, like, kind of research by Ersen Lab and our, our own. 
uh, but it's it's still in the it's still in the making. Uh, There's other research that's similar, and in, in some ways, like we've mentioned some of it there. In well, terms of using our setup specifically, uh, we the first one that we're working with is MIT. There's other universities that we can't really mention yet because it's not official. So, um, but we're already in talks with researchers within there who are seeking funding for having us there and developing the project and using it as a common platform, maybe for sharing research between institutions as well, since it's open source or whatever. And if people are making some advancement with the interface or with the technology and one thing it can be fed to the broader open source community that's one of our motivations for working with these large technical and scientific universities as well all right thank you so much also for taking the time for q a and thank you for this super interesting talk thank you so much for being here thanks